Hello everyone, my name is Anthony Baker and I am the product lead for VMware Gemfire. And I'm joined here today with John Martin, another product manager from Gemfire. And we are here to talk about the new Gemfire management console. Welcome, John. Hi, Anthony. How is everything going today? Uh, everything is going great today. Cool. How are you today? <laughs> I, I'm good. And um, I'm glad you're here. I think we have some exciting news to share and a hands-on live demo of this new product uh, we have uh, getting released out as a beta. So, um, but before we go there, um, I want to make sure all, all of you know uh, what we're going to talk about. Um, and so can you tell me um, about VMware Gemfire? Like, define that for me. Sure. Uh, so VMware Gemfire... Um, you'll often hear it referred to as a cache, but it is significantly more than a cache. So uh, what VMware Gemfire is, is it is a in-memory database that allows you to improve the performance of your applications. Um, and we've seen customers use this for systems of record, uh, as a cache, uh, and many other use cases. Cool. All right. And can you tell me, like, what's your top thing you like about Gemfire? So my favorite thing about Gemfire is hearing how customers are using the product. Um, and I would say every week I hear about a new customer that I had no idea was using Gemfire and like a different way that it's being used and how it's affecting sort of the way the world runs, which is sort of amazing to think about. Yeah, it's. I think it's great to do things that matter and, and um, not only, you know, in the technology space, but to the world we live in. So thanks for that intro, John. Um, let's go ahead and dive into the management console. Um, so first of all, like, what is the management console and how does it relate to Gemfire? Awesome. Okay. So the management console is a, is a user interface that you can connect up to your Gemfire clusters. Um, it connects to any type of Gemfire cluster, meaning Gemfire... Uh, that you're running standalone or a Gemfire cluster you're running on the Tanzu application service, um, or even a cluster that you're running on Kubernetes. And what it allows you to do is see all of your clusters and interact with them and manage them from the UI. Uh, and typically what you've done in the past is you've done your management through uh, the Gemfire shell, which we call Gfish. Um, however, that only lets you see one cluster at a time. And so what we're doing here is allowing customers to see you know, multiple clusters across the board at one time. Oh, this is great. Um, I'm excited to dig in. I know we've had a lot of interest for a long time from people who are uh, key Gemfire users. So I think this is going to um, uh, be super fun. Uh, let's go ahead and bring up um, your screen. Tell us what's going on here, John. Okay. So the Gemfire Management Console uh, is a separate download from Gemfire. Um, one of the reasons this uh, we did it this way is it allows us to iterate faster on the UI. Uh, so then we're not necessarily tied to a specific release of Gemfire. Um, so you go to Tanzu Net with the Tanzu network, uh, and here you'll see we have three different artifacts that you can download for the management console. Uh, so we have a jar file, we have an OVA file, and we have uh, a container that you can run, uh, you know, through Docker. So for this demo, I'm going to run through uh, the jar file on my local machine. Ooh, I have to sign in. OK, so while you're signing in, um, you mentioned that this can run against different versions of uh, Gemfire. Um, what versions are those? So currently, uh, the management console can run against Gemfire 9.15 and Gemfire 10 beta. Oh, very cool. So I can manage multiple clusters at different version levels. That's correct. And you can even see in the UI which version of the cluster that you're connected to. Oh, nice. Okay, so I've got the jar file downloaded. So now all I need to do is run java-jar and then my path to the jar file. Uh, and then you'll see down here, I'm running it on server port 8081. Um, it's a Spring Boot application, and Spring Boot applications normally run on 8080. So, but if you need to change the port, it's just as simple as adding a little argument to the, uh, the command. So just like any other Spring Boot app, it's configurable just like um, you set those properties. Very cool. 
And um, while this is starting up, um, what version of Java are you running? I'm currently running Java 11. Okay, that's good to know. All right, it's already up. So now I'm going to go to localhost 8081. And it automatically drops me into a default cluster view. Did, uh, so tell me about this cluster. Where, like, did you already create this? Um, um... So this is a cluster, it's a cluster that's running on my local machine. And the way that the UI is set up is that when you start it up, it automatically looks for any cluster running on the default host import of Gemfire. And if it finds one, it'll automatically connect it for you so that uh, if you're a developer, all you need to do is have your cluster running, start this up, and it automatically connects for you. All right. So in your case, you know, Gemfire is a distributed system. You had already started up um, Locator and two servers in your cluster. And when you fired up the, the, the management console, it found that cluster on your laptop and connected right to it. That's pretty That's cool. That's correct. I like yeah. it. Okay. So let me take a step back real quick. I can show you sort of where we're at. So this is the cluster home screen. So if I had multiple clusters connected, they'd all be listed here. Uh, and then it shows you the version of Gemfire that you're running and then how many locators and how many servers you're running. Okay. So then if you want to dive a little bit deeper into a cluster, you just click on the cluster name and it drops you into that cluster's details. All right. Now, just before we go go there, though, I'm, I'm curious, does the cluster, like, does the management console have to run on the same, uh, you know, laptop as the, as the Gemfire cluster? It does not. So what we'll do is let me walk you through connecting to a uh, cluster I have running on the Tanzu application service. I see. So I'm going to make a name here. Uh, you can call it whatever you want, just anything that you would recognize. Uh, I'm going to get my service key from my service instance. So you do need a service key for your service instance that you're running. Uh, and the reason that is, is the service key gives you the host name that you're going to connect to. Right. Okay. So, yep. The, just like I would expect in a Cloud Foundry environment, it's got my discovery and my credential information, um, all of that. Yep. And because it starts with HTTPS, I'm going to run it on 443, which is the default TLS port. Okay. So I'm going to copy in the username and the password. I'm going to save that. And then I have to click this button so that it makes sure that it sends it over the TLS, but I don't have to put in any information for these. All right, let's connect. All right. And we've connected. All right. So it's as simple as that. So this management console is running on your laptop right now, but the second cluster we created is running out in the cloud somewhere. I don't think we even know where, do we? Uh, I don't know where, actually. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's in the cloud. Okay, that's cool. So, um, um, I, you know, right now you're running the GUI, but I could also imagine a scenario where, you know, like this works great for local development. If I have it running locally and I can um, connect to a cluster on my laptop, but I could also set this up for a team um, and they could all share it and define these connections, you know, have them predefined uh, for different, you know, QA test environments and, and so on. So that, um, you know, there's a lot of predefined information that they could just log in and use. That's right. All right. Yeah, and we've talked to a lot of customers, and uh, you know what we hear a lot of times is operators that are running Gemfire. You know, they're not going to want to connect. Let's say they're running ten clusters. This allows them to have one unified console that all the operators can log into and look at the clusters that are running. Right, and so you don't have to remember a hundred passwords. Right. Exactly. <laughs> nice. Okay. Well, so we've defined some clusters. What, what can I do with that? All right, so let's dive in. We're going to look at this cluster here. Uh, so this is a pretty basic screen, right? This just shows you the version of Gemfire that's running, 
Uh, it shows you, you know, the members that are running in that cluster. So I've got one locator and two servers, uh, and then some basic information. So the name uh, of those members, the host, uh, the port for the servers, and then, you know, how much heap are they using? And then how much CPU percentage are they using? Uh, and then this tells you how long have they been running. So, and this is the amount of time without stopping or restarting or shutting down or anything like that. Right, right. So, so from here, um, you know, this has some basic monitoring going on, um, uh, at least to show me, you know, at a glance, uh, what's happening in the cluster. That's right. Nice. I like it. Yeah. Um, the other piece is that what we've added is an easy way to connect to GFish through a console. Um, so if you need to do something outside of the UI, you can click copy to clipboard and then in your GFish terminal. So this, this is a terminal I have running GFish, which is connected or not connected. Let me see. To my cluster. Okay, so now I'm not connected. So now I'm going to copy this connection string, which is uh, specific to this default cluster, into GFish. And now I'm connected. Cool. Yeah. And I, I could see, you know, like in this case, that's that's a pretty short string, but like who likes typing? But, you know, once, you know, for your other cluster, you had like quite a bit more information that was necessary from credentials and, you know, the the um, host name was super long and complicated. So um, just having a little, you know, a uh, toil saver like that in the GUI, I think is going to be um, super helpful. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So let's move on. So the next tab we have is regions. And so this tab will show you all the regions that are in your cluster. Uh, so currently I have, you know, nine regions in my cluster. Uh, and then it gives some basic information. So what the type of the region is, right? Is it a partition? Does it have persistence? Um, is it a replicate region? Uh, it tells you how many entries are in that region. And then it tells you the size of the entries and it'll adjust based on, you know, the, the, the amount of data in there, right? So this is 58 megabytes, right? This has nothing in it. Um, and then we, you know, and then it shows you if there's persistence and if it's configured. So do I have a disk store that this region is on, right? So some of these do and some of them don't. Now, if I want to learn a little bit more about one of these regions, I simply click on the name, and then it shows me the details down here. Okay. Um, I'm actually super curious, John. Uh, that that region name is Jumpfire for Redis. Uh, that seems strange. It is a little strange. Uh, however, there's another product we have. It's called Jumpfire for Redis Apps. Uh, it's an extension that works with Jumpfire. And so what it allows you to do is run your Redis clients against a Gemfire server, and you can send Redis commands to Gemfire. Okay, and it looks like you have because we have some data in this region. I have. So uh, I filled the region with about 100,000 entries, um, and you can see them down here. This is showing you, of the members that I have running, how many entries are on each server. Now, if you were interested to say, like, how many entries are in, you know, in bytes, per server, right? This shows you that. Or if you want to see how many buckets I have on per server, right? So I've got 128 here and 128 here. It means my data is balanced, which is great. If my data wasn't balanced, I could simply click on this button and it would rebalance the buckets. And then I could see in the graph that these would be balanced. Oh, cool. So um, you're able to get some insight into what's happening in the cluster and then also manage those um, operations as well. Absolutely. All right, so this is great, but can I also use it to configure the server? Like we have a bunch of regions here. How did they get there? Ah, so if you want to create a region, you can simply click on this button and we're gonna say uh, new region 85. And then I get to select what type of region I want, right? So we have two types, partition or replicate. So I'll choose partition. Do I want any redundant copies of the data? Sure, I'll take one. Uh, I'm going to enable stats, 
And then I'd like some persistence in case something goes wrong with my cluster and it goes down. I want to be able to retrieve that data again. So I'm going to set the disk store to default. And then I don't want everything in my region, in this region to stick around. So I'm going to set this time to live in seconds. We'll set it to 30 seconds. And then we'll set some eviction based on the JVM heap size. Cool. And I'm going to click create region. there we go yeah um one of the things i love about this is you know there's a lot of things you can do obviously to configure a region and this gui kind of helps you walk through that and give you gives you a menu of what you can do um you know we have great documentation you can use gfish for it but having it graphical just sometimes helps get someone uh started i like that yeah absolutely and we tried to keep the number of options sort of on the smaller side for most customers. Um, and again, connecting to GFish would allow you to do more advanced configuration of a region if you needed it, but this should hopefully fill the use case for you know the 80% of customers. All right, uh, next up we'll talk about configuration. Uh, so this is a pretty simple page, um, but what it does is it allows you to see the configuration of your cluster that's saved in your cluster XML file. Uh, and so here you can see this includes information about regions um, and disk stores uh, for the cluster. Nice. So I, I like it. It's, you know, single, you know, pane view of all the configured items um, that can be super helpful. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's move on to disk stores. So disk stores are used uh, for persistence. Uh, this allows your cluster to come back up with data if something were to go wrong. Uh, and so what we display here is all the disk stores that are associated with this cluster. So we show things like the name, you know, is it active? If it's missing, it'll tell you that it's missing. Um, the configured max size. So this represents the size that it can grow to, not its actual size. Um, the number of, or the members that it's associated with. Uh, and then the queue size. And then if you want to see more details, you simply click on the disk store and you get a lot of additional information, including what regions are saved on this disk store or associated with the disk store. Right. That's pretty fast. I like it. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, I, I, oh, I think I could find that out, but I have to remember the gfish command to type. So. Yes. <laughs> or commands, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the other benefit that we have here with disk stores is if you need a new one, you can now create one from the UI. Mm. So I'll create a new one. I'm going to call it alt 85, and then I'm going to give it a directory of delete me five. Um, so these are the two fields that you have to enter to create a disk store. Uh, but you can do the, you know, these additional fields if needed. So I'm going to click create. And there we go. I have a new disk store available. So now if I go to regions and I do create a region and I want to enable persistence, the disk store is now available to choose. Easy peasy. Easy peasy. All right. Next up, let's talk about GFish. So all right, we have GFish over here. It's running in my terminal. Now I have GFish here, and it's running in my web browser. Okay, why so do I what, want that? Uh, you want that because now you don't have to remember that connection string. You can if you want, but now I can simply do it from the UI. Oh, um, very nice. Like, <laughs> I can imagine, like, if I'm managing a bunch of Gemfire clusters, this would be a lot easier way to spin through and do some GFish commands. Uh, you know, if I need to drop down um, to a command line and do something, it's nice to get, you know, an always connected terminal. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a feature that we've added is that, let's say you run a command every day or every 10 minutes or whatever your needs are. You can now make a custom command so that you don't have to type it in every single time. So then it shows up here. And if I want to run this command, I simply click it and run it. Oh, I see. So 
what you could do is you could define that command for me and I could run it then. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do I like it. Cool. All right. Next up, let's talk about log files. Uh, sometimes things go wrong in a cluster and you need to look at the log files. Um, so what we've done is built in a way for users to look at those log files. So here, this spits out server number one, and I can see the log files for the past day. And then if I need to see more, I can then load them in. right? And this will keep loading until I run out of log files to pull in. Nice, now, sometimes, yeah. Sometimes you need to compare across two, two servers. So you can then click on this, and you'll see, oh, there's no data logged in the past 24 hours for server two. OK. So then what I can do is I can filter this and say, OK, well, show me the data from the 25th. Now what I'm seeing is the server one log and the server two log for the 25th. And I can figure out if something went wrong on that day, I can now look between these two logs and see if something's different. Right. And see if one server has an error and the other doesn't, or like all of the things you have to do in a distributed system when something exactly. bad happens. Yep. That's cool. Yeah. All right. The last piece we'll walk through is functions. Uh, so I don't have any functions loaded in yet. Um, but if I did, they would show up here, um, right? You have the name of the function, where the function is deployed, and then you'd be able to execute that function right from the UI. Okay. So now, let's say you have written a function and you want to deploy it to this cluster. I can click on the function. I can find it in my file browser, and I can simply deploy that function right to the cluster from here. Right. So I write my code, put it in a jar file, uh, find it you know, in that deploy function uh, window, and boom, I can send it over to the cluster. And then right from my GUI, I can execute it, look at the results, try again, things like that. I like it. That's right. Yeah. Cool. Um, what else do you want to show us, John? That covers a lot of the, the basics for today. Oh. Uh, let me see if I can. OK. So the last thing I want to show is that we, there is some security. So I've been running the application in what we call developer mode, right? which means there's no username or password required. Uh, and that's going to be typical probably for a lot of developers that are running it on their local machines. Uh, but if you need to run it in a more secure environment and connect it to, let's say, OAuth or LDAP systems right, or Active Directory, you can simply select that. And then we allow you to configure that information that suits your needs for your enterprise system. That makes a lot of sense because especially if I have clusters that do have security turned on, perhaps they have certain kinds of data or other things, um, you know, stored even for, you know, test regions, it may make sense to, you know, ensure that only the appropriate people have access to deploy code, to run queries or, or other things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Cool. Um, one thing I noticed when you were uh, when you started off was you downloaded um, a beta version of that. So uh, tell us like where it's at and what's coming next. Yeah. So the beta version's out. Uh, go download it. Try it. Send us your feedback. Um, you know, we're hoping our plan is to make this uh, available uh, in GA by the end of March. Um, you know, we're going to add some, a few features. I'm not going to talk about those for between now and GA. Uh, post GA, what we'd like to do is add some things like uh, monitoring in the UI, uh, the ability to browse your data, um, the ability to download your log files, things like that uh, to help enhance the, uh, the UI. Oh, that sounds great. Um, I'm excited to try this out. I'm excited to hear the feedback from all of our users. And I'm excited to see what comes next as well. So thanks so much, John. Um, I think you've uh, done a great, vid uh, great demo today. And thanks, everyone, for watching. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Anthony.